All right, it is good to see you this evening, and we are continuing our study in the book of Genesis tonight, and we've reached Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. And we read in that verse, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now normally, in uh, narrative literature, you wouldn't stop after reading one verse. Uh, you would allow the flow of the text to just continue and to kind of preach itself because uh, it's a story. And uh, to cut into the text kind of... Uh, interrupts the whole idea. But in this case, uh, even though a word-by-word -word analysis is not called for in a text like this, sometimes you reach a concept that takes a little bit of extra time to work through, and we have come to such a point in the Scripture. Uh, this week, when I reached Genesis 3.1, actually, it's been a few weeks now that I've been looking at this text, uh, I was struck by... Uh, this idea of the serpent as it's introduced here in Genesis 3.1. And since this is the Bible's first mention, if you're reading through the Bible, of the devil, uh, I think that we should take special notice of this text. There's actually an interpretive principle that whenever something is mentioned first, it is a very significant point in Scripture. I believe that the Scripture is progressively reveal, revealing doctrine. And so we don't even read about Satan here. We read serpent. And so we wonder how can we be sure that we're talking about Satan? Well, of course, you have to read the rest of the scripture to understand that the writer is indeed talking about the devil here. Scripture says that the serpent is cunning or subtle here. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, the text says. Uh, but... This is not just talking about the ordinary animal kingdom serpent. Um, there is something uh, far different about this animal in the text. As a matter of fact, the serpent, we learn, is a tool that is being utilized by another unnamed presence. And the presence will seek to undermine man's capacity uh, to rightly relate to his creator. And so... Uh, it's not until we get into the scripture and especially as we work it out into the uh, New Testament, especially Revelation 12, that we learn that the serpent is indeed Satan. Now we will pick up the flow of the narrative next week and um, we will uh, learn that this serpent mentioned here at the advent of chapter 3 is so cunning that he's able to confuse and deceive Eve into eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which in chapter 2, God clearly warned uh, Adam to not eat of that tree. And so she does so, and she does so as a result of his opposition to her. I mean, the Bible's very clear about that. So therefore, it is good for us to pause and understand our adversary. You know the saying, know your enemy. And so you have to understand what does the Bible say about our adversary, and I think it's helpful to do that now before we go any further in our study of the book of Genesis. Sometimes people go to all the wrong sources in order to find out about the devil. They will read about him in occultic magazines, or they will find um, different things like tarot cards and psychic readings and things of this nature, are very popular today and they mess around with things that are demonic and satanic even games like Dungeons and Dragons and other things like that uh, and they get into this uh, spiral downward into great despair and depression and an inordinate fear uh, of these things uh, and this can kind of uh, bring Christians into the net too and Satan effectively uses that so that all of our thoughts are occupied with the enemy instead of our thoughts being on Christ. And so we need to be very careful uh, about that. If you're well-read theologically, then you know that there's the other side of the spectrum too. There are actually people, if you read their doctrine and, and their commentaries and their theologies, you say to yourself, well, they seem to be very very conservative, they're right on the beam, but then they deny a literal hell. They deny that Satan himself exists. Uh, and 
they, they certainly admit that evil is in the world, but not a real uh, entity or an actual personality called Satan. Well, you know, the scripture is very clear about that. Satan is an actual being. He is not just a concept or an idea. And uh, it, it, that's why I think you have to look at Genesis as historic literature here. Sometimes people will say, well, he's just, this idea of Satan is just this idea of personified evil. It's just a legend. Uh, well, we believe that God gave us the scriptures so that the reality of Satan could never be disputed. And yet men still dispute it. They deny that he exists. Even those that call themselves Christians, which is unbelievable. Um, when we look at the scripture, we hear Jesus say in Luke 10 and verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Well, Jesus didn't see a concept or an idea fall from heaven. He, called, he saw Satan fall from heaven, an actual angelic being. An actual being stands before God and accuses Job in Job chapters 1 and 2. He is there as the accuser of Job. When we go into the New Testament, it's not an idea or a concept that tempts the Lord Jesus in Matthew 4. It's an actual being that tempts the Lord Jesus. Jesus said that everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, was everlasting fire prepared for an idea or a concept? And the answer to that is, of course not. It's not even rational to uh, allow that idea to come into our thinking. But sometimes, through this misguided idea of mercy, man-centered leniency, we can't grasp this concept of hell. We can't grasp the idea of an actual a uh, satanic being that tempts us, and so we just dismiss it out of our heads. Well, that's a very dangerous thing. I think that would be something that the devil would delight in us doing. Denying the reality of Satan as personally, specifically an angel, uh, as personally active in the world, I think is denying the truthfulness of the words of the Lord Jesus. Are you ready to do that? Of course, none of us here would be ready to do that. So let's begin then with the creation of Satan. How did Satan begin? We don't know precisely when the angels were created. We know that they are created beings, but we don't know exactly when they were created. Uh, we only know that the Lord created Satan and probably the rest of the angelic host before he planted the Garden of Eden. That's the only thing that we can say for sure. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 says that all things were created through the Lord Jesus and for the Lord Jesus. All things. That includes Satan. Right? He was created for the Lord Jesus and he was created by the Lord Jesus. Now, if you say that Satan is not a created being, then what has to be the conclusion? Well, you'd have to conclude that Satan is self-existent, that that he is self-existent just says God is self-existent. What do we call that? Well, you say, great sin, great sin. Yes, that's true, but it is also known as dualism. It's why people have this idea of a force out there, and the good and the evil draw from the same force. You know, it's that kind of dualism that we kind of overlook when we're watching our science fiction movies or overlook uh, when we kind of peruse uh, the different literature of the world. And yet, <clears throat> that's what we're looking at here. God is the only self-existent being, right? He is the only self-existent being, and he is good. Satan is not self-existent evil. He was created originally as good, very good in the sight of God. And then he fell in sin. So God alone is the creator we conclude then that Satan is a created being. Now we know this from one key, we're going to look at two texts, but we know this from one key Old Testament text in Ezekiel chapter 28. So if you have your Bible or the handout tonight, it has the text on the handout, then, then go ahead and turn to Ezekiel 28 and we're going to read that extended portion of scripture beginning in verse 11 and we'll read through verse 19. Now, it'd be better if you were there in the text with me so that you kind of sink in uh, there. 
Ezekiel 28 and verse 11, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up the lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now, I would argue with you, if you're going to highlight something, 14 and 15 would be it. I, I would argue that this could never be said about any man. It, you know, you were perfect in all your ways. You, maybe we could say that about the Lord Jesus. Well, we could, right? But we could not say that about any other man. And yet, that's what we see here in verses 14 and 15. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, Satan falling from heaven like lightning. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who, never, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you, and have become, you have become a horror, and shall be no more forever." Now you say, well, it seems to go back and forth from, from an actual person to, to this anointed cherub. Could it be talking about two different entities, an actual king of Tyre and Satan? And that is my view of the text. A lot of people don't like an understanding like that, but I think that that makes the most sense. I think it is talking about a historical king of Tyre, there is uh, Tyre on the uh, northernmost coast of, uh, uh, of Israel. It was, a, it was a section that should have been absolutely uh, taken by the tribes of Dan and Asher, but it wasn't uh, because the people were too strong uh, there. They weren't too strong for God, but they were too strong for the tribes who refused to depend on God for the strength that they needed to overcome their foe. And so Tyre then just stayed there and Israel began to cooperate with Tyre and uh, they in time become an economic ally to Israel. Now remember they're in the north so they're always going to be in league with the northern kingdom when the kingdom split. And before they split even David uh, struck a deal with the king of Tyre to get cedar in order to build the temple. Solomon had a good relationship with him as well so that they could build the temple with the, uh, with the wood that the, these people provided, not only the wood, but, but skilled laborers as well. Israel, in turn, provided agriculture uh, produce uh, for um, tires so that they could eat. When the kingdom divides, they maintain the close connection, but you remember a very uh, striking, evil character in the scripture named Jezebel, right? She comes from this region. Uh, her father was part of Tyre's kingdom. And his name was Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And so you can see then how the alliance with Tyre uh, really began to cause a problem for Israel. The only time that that alliance dissolved 
was when it paved the way for Israel's demise to the Assyrians. They were taken away into captivity in the year 722. And so uh, there are several prophetic passages then in the Old Testament condemning Tyre. And a lot of it stems from this historic account. And the reason is, is because they were very evil. They were uh, very much idolatrous uh, place. And they were very much people that were consumed with greed and with getting things. So the city used the enmity then between Assyria and Egypt to become very wealthy. They actually exploited Israel and took advantage of their precarious situation. Kind of reminds me to the south of what Edom did to Judah. And it goes on, of course, the city was the center for all kinds of sexual immorality that we read about in the Kings. And, and that idolatry affected uh, Israel to a great degree. The city was proud because of her wealth and her strategic port location. As a matter of fact, it is perhaps the reason why uh, no king in all of the northern kingdom did good, did good in God's sight. He only did that which was evil in God's sight. Every single king in the northern confederacy. So in that way then, Satan, or Tyre rather, becomes an apt description of Satan. We, we can take that city and we can say, wow, they are the epitome of evil. Well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> I would imagine that many of her kings were fully given over to Satan and to his influence. Earlier in Ezekiel 28 and verse 2, God declares, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am God, I sit in the seat of God's, in the midst of the seas, he would send then strangers against them as a form of judgment. Now he's speaking quite obviously to the king of Tyre there. The arrogance is what ties both Tyre, her king, and Satan together. Uh, the arrogance and the pride. I believe that that passage then is giving us a very strong clue as to the sin of Satan. Verses 14 and 15 really clarify matters. Um, Ezekiel 28 refers then to a king and to Satan. Now let, let's conclude some things. Verse 12, it says he was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's how he was before his fall. Verse 13 says he was once in Eden, the garden of God. He existed then before sin entered the world. It says in verse 13, he donned a precious stone co covering. Uh, all kinds of stones here listed must have been something very stunning to behold. Something even beyond our imagination. He was the anointed cherub who covers, it says in verse 14. Now, cherub is a classification of angel. And so a covering angel, if you will. Genesis 3.24 teaches us that cherubim guarded the holiness of God by making sure that nobody could go back and have entrance to the tree, right? So the cherubim were responsible for that. They were living creatures associated with the throne of God and the holiness of God. Ezekiel 1 and verse 5 confirms that. They are connected to the very presence of God. And Satan seems to be the chief cherub. He is the one who covers the holiness and beauty of God. And so somewhere along the line, he lifted himself up as being something great. Instead of glorifying God, what did he do? He glorified himself. He, he stole glory that belonged to God. God made him the way that he was. God made him perfect in all of his ways. From the day he was created, it says in verse 15. And this would continue from the day he was created right up until the day that iniquity was found in him, according to the scripture. So the sin of Satan, the, the iniquity that he was involved in, was pride. Lifting himself up instead of lifting God up. The names of Satan. Uh, I included four on your handout. There are many more. Uh, but the names of Satan tell us a little bit about the activity of Satan. For example... Satan itself, that name means adversary. It means the opposer. It tells us something about the activity of, 
uh, not only who he is, but what he does in the world. He's called the devil, which is a word for slanderer, to speak evil of someone, something that isn't true, but to malign their character and their reputation. Well, Satan does that. Uh, the devil does that uh, to, to believers. He, he, he does that uh, about God himself. He's a slanderer. He's a liar and a deceiver. He's called the evil one. The evil one pointing up his evil character. He is also called the serpent, which is what we find in our text in Genesis 3 and verse 1. You say, what is that, what is that about? Why, why call him the serpent? Well, I think it has to do with the cunningness and the subtlety with which he operates here. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, it says, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. Revelation 12, 9 uh, mentions the serpent again. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. Now what is John referring to when he says that serpent of old? Well, everyone would have thought back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, where Satan is referred to as a serpent. He's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. There are also titles that occur referring to Satan. Less frequently they occur, but they help us to understand him. He's called the great red dragon. You say, what is that pointing to? Somebody who is very fierce in conflict and unmerciful. Accuser of the brethren. He's always accusing us. Night and day, the scripture says. But Jesus Christ is there as our advocate. He comes alongside us. He pleads our case. So Satan is always accusing us. Um, and, and Jesus is always there as our advocate. So here's the thing. If Satan is always there accusing us, let's leave the dirty work to him and stop accusing one another. That would be a good plan, don't you think? Uh, we don't want to be involved in the same activity that he's involved in. He's called the tempter, which he's very effective at. He tempted the Lord Jesus. I mean, it was a real temptation. Jesus fasted and prayed to face that temptation. Now, you, you, you might dismiss that and say, well, he's God. No, no, he was tempted as a man, such as we, yet without sin. Okay, so you cannot deny that he was tempted. And it was a very difficult thing. He's very effective with Eve. He's very effective in undermining God's creation. He's called even the ruler of this world. He's called the God of this world. You realize that? He's called the prince and power of the air. He's the spirit who is now working in the sons of disobedience. And all of them belong to him. He is a deceiver in scripture. He's called Beelzebub, which means ruler of the demons. He's called Belial in 1 Corinthians, which means the worthless one or the wicked one. These are the names of Satan, and they give us a good idea of what he is all about. And then we look at the sin of Satan. Sin was found in the serpent, and that sin was pride. God, now here's the thing. We, we see this, and sin's entrance into the world and, and it's coming through this deception from the devil. And, and we wonder, well, is God responsible for this? And the answer is absolutely not. Right? God is not responsible for sin. Right? You say, but sin has to be in God's plan. Well, yes, it is. All right? But God is not responsible for it. All right? God is not responsible for Satan falling into sin. God is not responsible when we sin. Right? We are the ones that commit sin. Satan and mankind then are culpable for their sin. If God is angry with sin, and he is, there's no doubt about that, the scripture is clear about this, then his creation is blameworthy, not him. You cannot blame God for sin. And it really is a ridiculous notion to do so. God permits sin and rebellion. He doesn't cause it. 
the Bible is clear that he's not the author of sin. And so it's in this way that I say that sin and Satan are a part of the plan of God. Um, there is nothing else that you can say. I mean, it's very clear in the scripture. And so we can't assign this evil to God. We're taught that a pastor of a church shouldn't be a novice. He shouldn't be new convert in the faith. You say, well, why is that? Well, in 1 Timothy 3, 6, the danger is that that pastor would become puffed up with pride and he would fall into the same condemnation of the devil. All right, well, then what is that condemnation? Well, it's pride. A new believer entering the role of pastor is almost certainly going to take glory for himself that belongs to God, and that's exactly what Satan did. And so he has to be somebody who is strong in the faith. This helps us really to understand why Satan fell. He fell because of his pride. There is another key passage that I'd like us to turn to here in the Old Testament. It's found in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14, and this is verses 12 through 17. I think this passage makes it clear that Satan's problem was that he became puffed up with pride. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? Again, we're looking at a passage of Scripture where we have an unbelieving king being mentioned here in Isaiah 14 and verse 4. We didn't read the whole context, but verse 4 mentions him. And so we have the same type of deal as we had in Ezekiel. You have another unbelieving king. This time it's the king of Babylon. Now I think it's interesting here. It is my belief, all right, that not only does this... Uh, king of Babylon become a type of the Antichrist and his future fall, but he is also an antitype that is looking back. And I think that uh, he serves then as a picture of Satan and Satan's previous fall. You say, you know, the passage looks back and forward at the same time. Is that possible? Well, yes, I, I believe it is. That's the depth of God's word. It, it is something that is striking. The passage describes what Jesus said when he said, Satan is falling from heaven like lightning there in Luke 10 and verse 18. The name Lucifer means morning star. I think that that's interesting uh, because Jesus is called the bright and morning star in Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16. You say, why would Satan and Jesus have the same name? Well, Satan is forever trying to counterfeit the Lord Jesus. And so he has a plan, uh, and he's very good at, at being subversive and carrying out his plan. You say, what motivates this plan? His heart motivates this plan. He has these heart whispers that drive him. Things are working from the inside out for Satan, too. Okay, you, you read the uh, book... Uh, Pursuing holiness, okay? Satan would write the book, Pursuing Unholiness. He has an answer. It's always the opposite, all right? He is always looking to subvert God and to bring things into his own will. And so he says, I will, five times. He says, I will ascend into heaven. This means that he would ascend in the sense of being equal to God. I mean, it just doesn't mean that he will enter into heaven. I mean, he's already there. Right? It means that he would be equal to God. It says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. You say, what is that talking about? Well, I'm not sure. It could mean one of two things. It could mean that he would exalt his throne above the angelic hosts uh, because 
we have the these stars uh, being mentioned elsewhere. What is that? Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So I thought somebody was competing with me. Uh, it's Satan. Yeah. Uh, so we see this, the stars of God, and, and we think of, okay, we'll, we'll let you get r rid of that. <laughs> okay. We, we're thinking of that, um, we're thinking of the angelic hosts, because in other passages of scripture, the stars are likened to the angels. But, but it could be talking about the stars, and he's going to exalt himself over the entire universe, and this is a way of saying that. Uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, basically the same result there. Uh, third, I will, he says, I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I, I think that this refers to the fact that he, he wants all of this authority. He is driven by his own lust for power and ambition. And so he, he is driven in this way. He says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now when you see the glory of God being represented in the Old Testament, what do you think of? Well, you think of clouds. You think of the Shekinah glory of God. And uh, certainly I think that this is uh, a, a way in which he is saying, I'm going to be even above God's glory. I'm going to be glorified. And then the fifth I will, I will be like the Most High. Satan's desire was to be like his creator. But, but not like his creator in the way that we are commanded to be like our creator, right? I mean, we're to be Christ-like. What does that mean? It means we're to be loving and gentle and filled with grace and, and all of those things, right? Uh, but when Satan is saying, I will be like the Most High, he's saying, I'm going to be omnipotent, I'm going to be sovereign, I'm going to be omniscient. These are things that belong to God only. They don't belong to Satan. But he is saying, I will be like that, though. You just wait and see. This is a challenge, then, of God's authority over his creation. It is the creation telling the creator, I'm going to be the creator. I'm going to be the self-existent one, the sovereign one. And so you can see how sin has twisted and perverted him. The serpent's sin affected other angels, too. Uh, it affects all people. Even to this day, we're affected by Satan in ways that I, I'm firmly convinced we don't even understand. Um, I mean, that's what makes him the ruler of this world, the prince and the power of the air. He energizes this world system. He utilizes the position that he has. But you say, but only as God allows, right? Yeah, only as God allows. You say, well, why does God permit it? Why does God allow it? Well, we can ask him when we come to him. Uh, but I know one thing, that it is very hard to explain that without explaining, you know, without getting into uh, areas that are very difficult to talk about. Um, I would say that I believe in human responsibility. And so I think that responding to God is something that God wants us to do. Now, you might not like to call that free will. I'm okay with that. But I think that we respond to God in this way. And, and God, of course, is overall, and he's sovereign. Nobody's saved apart from his grace. But we respond to him by faith. And so that helps me to understand it a little bit. But even then, it's very difficult. That leads to the attacks of Satan. You say, well, how does he attack us? Well, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 that he can be a ferocious lion. But often, according to 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, he comes in deceitfully as an angel of light. So he can be both of those things. Um, Satan attacked Jesus by testing him in the wilderness. He was hoping to tempt Jesus to commit evil. Instead, God proved that the Lord Jesus was sinful or sinless. Wow, sinless. Okay, you know that was a slip of the tongue. That the Lord Jesus was sinless and that he uh, would commit no sin even under that great temptation that he went through in the wilderness. Uh, his primary motive behind the temptation was to get Jesus to think and to act in such a way that he was moving independently of God. I mean, you have this, if you are the son of God, then just do these things. 
Do them of your own volition and of your, your, your own will. Uh, set aside God's will. You know, act on your own if you're, you're the son of God. That's what he's doing there. Satan attacks God himself by offering all of these counterfeit uh, programs and, and kingdoms. There's a satanic kingdom represented by the kingdoms of man. And they build themselves up like the statue in Daniel. And they're infused with satanic power. But then here comes the kingdom of Christ represented by the stone that comes down and just absolutely obliterates the statue. And it becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. That is a reference to Christ's millennial kingdom. And yet Satan has his own program and his own kingdoms that he thinks will win out in the end. They will not. Um, here in Genesis, in our text, he's going to get at Eve and he's going to say to her, you can be like God. And so he tempts her. He says, you can know good and evil. And he offers her a form of godliness while denying the power thereof, right? That's exactly what happens to us. His servants are disguised as servants of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 15. But they are far from being servants of righteousness. Satan attacks the nations, we're told, by deceiving them. He's duped the whole world into believing that, that they are able to govern their countries, that they're able to have some kind of semblance of control apart from God. We can have peace in the Middle East. And we can do it apart from God. See, that's the whole deal. And of course, they just make a bigger mess of things as time goes by. Satan attacks unbelievers. You say, well, how does he do that? He blinds their minds. Uh, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that their, their minds are so blinded that they will not believe the gospel. He takes away the precious seed of God's word from their hearts in Luke chapter 8 and verse 12. Satan promotes this counterfeit religion as a means of blindness. Do you know that there are only two religions in the world? There's false religion and true religion. And the only true religion is Bible-believing Christianity. <laughs> That's it. Everything else is right there under the uh, under the control of Satan. And he uses all of the world's religious systems in a very uh, crafty way. He even has a counterfeit Christianity uh, that he uses to dupe people. They're really, really close to the truth. They believe that Jesus is God even. They believe that he is crucified in the, on the cross. But they don't know what it means to be saved by grace alone through faith alone. That is terrible. And so Satan continually does things like this. And Satan attacks believers too. Say, so what does he do in our lives? I thought, you know, he's kind of been rendered uh, powerless against us. Well, that's a lie that he would like you to believe. He's not powerless against you. I mean, the scripture is very, very clear. He can be very oppressive in his attacks against you. He, he will test you. He will tempt you just as he did the Lord Jesus, and you can fall to that temptation. And yet, as a Christian, you can stand against that temptation and be approved by God. Isn't that wonderful? You can stand against the wiles of the devil, but only as you depend upon the righteousness of Christ. You say, what's Satan's goal? Satan's goal is to get us to sin. His goal is to get us to get our eyes off of Jesus Christ and yet, uh, here we are, sin has no power over us because of our faith in Christ, and yet we can still succumb to him. We have to fight. We have to be careful. Satan tempts you. Satan wants you to conform to, to the pressures and to the workings of this world. He, he wants to sift you as wheat. Paul labored among the Thessalonians for, for only a brief time. Some say it was just a month before he was driven away. And he left some Christians that were there, but they were baby Christians. And Satan hindered Paul's return in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18. But Paul was able to send Timothy to go back to see if the believers had given in to Satan's temptations. The big fear for the Apostle Paul was that through Satan's subtlety, the work that he had among the Thessalonians would have been done in vain. 
And that can happen. The seed can just fall on that hard ground. It doesn't take root. The devil comes along and he strips it away. You look at the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember when we were in Acts chapter 5, we went through that? What happened? What fueled that hypocrisy? What well, was Satan? Satan deceived them. Satan attempted them to lie, and they did. They, their hearts were filled to lie uh, against the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5. They had an external form of godliness. What was it? This outward generosity. But they denied the power thereof. They were still hanging on to their selfishness. How can a person be at one time both generous and selfish? It's impossible. And so Satan tempts believers in that way. Did, in, in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5, he, he tempts believers toward sexual immorality, trying to get them to fall into sexual sin. That's why God provided marriage so that husbands and, and wives could benefit one another physically. And if they fail to do that, if husbands and wives fail in that area, then Satan is given this opportunity to tempt believers towards sexual immorality. And they fall to that all the time. You've heard of believers in Christ who have fallen to sexual immorality. If you think that that's impossible and that it will not ever happen to you, then Satan really has blinded you and deceived you. We all can fall in this way. We have to look out for his temptations. But he is there to oppose us too. He is our adversary, remember. He works against many good and godly activities that we are trying to do as Christians. One of the number one areas where he opposes us is in evangelism. I was talking to a believer here not long ago, and uh, we were having a good discussion about evangelism. And he had just gone out and he had uh, been working and, and laboring to get the gospel out. And uh, what had happened is when he went home, he started to have all kinds uh, of problems. And he quickly connected the idea that Satan, uh, this was kind of a satanic attack. Just all of these things coming out of the blue. Well, I think all of us have experienced that. Uh, we go out and, and, and we're attacked all of a sudden because we have a good night of evangelism or we have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone that we've been praying for a long time and then all of a sudden there are attacks that are coming from other directions. We have someone that is opposing us. You say, is Satan himself personally opposing me? Well, maybe not, but he has a vast array, a network of demons who can do so and certainly they do so. Um, as a matter of fact, even in the church, we have people... Uh, who are in our church, maybe, right? That are weeds. There are weeds among the wheat, the Bible tells us. And so you're, you're going to have situations like that. Satan will bring opposition within the church because how can weeds and wheat be unified, right? And so the weeds sap the life of the church. Satan snatches away the word sown in the hearts of men, Mark chapter 4 and verse 15. He hinders our, our ministry by using the government to work against us. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 18. I think we'll see more of that, by the way. He incites persecution and imprisonment so that Christians are going to be disabled by fear. And then all of a sudden they will stop witnessing because they are more fearful about what's going to happen to them. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12 and verse 10. And so when we sin, what happens to us? Well, we can't lose our salvation. Let, let's make that very clear. No Christian can lose his salvation because God is the one that saved you. And Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes on me has everlasting life. Everlasting life will never be taken away. So what does Satan do if he can't take away your salvation? He accuses you night and day. Uh, and so we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 John 2 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So what is happening? Satan is bringing this pressure uh, upon us. And it's great and oppressive at times. Uh, you, you think about the man that was disciplined in the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What happened to him? Well, he was disciplined out of the church. Um, and, and the Bible is very clear. It was because of incest. 
But he came under conviction, he confessed his sin, and Paul urged the church to receive him back into fellowship in 2 Corinthians. You say, why did Paul do that? Well, he did it certainly for unity within the, the Corinthian church, but he also did it uh, in order so that, rather, this man wouldn't be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow, the scripture says. Uh, the Bible tells us that he needed to be forgiven and restored. And if there is church discipline with no eye toward restoration, if we're thinking to ourselves, well, we, we carry through with church discipline, glad we got that person out of here, then there is something very wrong with our church. The idea is church discipline with an eye toward restoration so that this person is not overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. 2 Corinthians 2.5 says, But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much swallow or sorrow. Sorry. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him, for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Satan can even get into a church and cause big problems even when we're trying to do the right thing. Paul also encouraged women who were widowed when they were at a very young age he said to them, you need to remarry. Apparently, Satan was fueling gossip uh, among some of these younger women because of their idle lives. And so Paul's uh, suggestion to them was to remarry so that they would, it, it says in 1 Timothy 5.14, I'll just use Paul's words here, Therefore I desire that younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproach, reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. This is in the church. After Satan. Satan cannot take our souls back. So he works very, very hard to devour our testimony and our usefulness for Christ. And he will do whatever he can to get in there and to cause problems. He is a very powerful and effective adversary. And he, he has this vast array. He's not like God. He can't be everywhere at once, but he has this vast array and network of demonic hosts that carry out his bidding. He is the energy behind the world in which we live, the present arrangement of things. He is the God of this age and the prince and the power of the air. And yet, and yet, God can enable victory over him through faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we need not fear him. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Are you born of God? I am. We can overcome the world, the satanically infused system. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? Our faith, it says. Our dependence and, and belief in Christ Jesus, depending upon him, who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And so the ability to overcome Satan comes after salvation. There is no hope to overcome him before salvation. You are a son of the evil one before uh, salvation. The son, of, the son or the daughter of disobedience according to the scripture. We are presently, as believers, overcoming the world right now. Not just in the future will we overcome the world, but we are overcoming the world right now because we've been saved out of the world. And so our victory today is only possible because of Jesus' victory over 2,000 years ago. We have the victory, and our faith is strong. You say, well, how is our faith strong? Our faith is strong because it is in Jesus, and Jesus is strong. You aren't the strong one. Jesus is. And when you depend on him, when he's the object of your faith, then you have overcoming faith. Why? Because you trust in Jesus. That's what the scripture teaches. 
Faith in Jesus Christ enables you to trust today, tomorrow, and even to the day that you meet Jesus Christ. You can and you must live a Christ-like life even in a satanic world. That's what God wants us to do. The serpent is cunning, Genesis 3.1. He speaks to Eve in the Garden of Eden. But one thing that we need to remember is that he is a fallen being. And he has a place reserved for him in the lake of fire. He is going to work hard when we come back to Genesis chapter 3. And as we look at the fall of man, keep in mind that he didn't leave mankind alone in Genesis chapter 3. Even when we have victories, he is going to come back again and again and again. And do you know how the Bible teaches us in, a, in Colossians 3 and Ephesians chapter 4 that we're to put off the old man and to put on the new? And we sometimes say that we're habituating our life to godliness, which we should do. There are only a few basic things that we need to know in order to do that. And then the rest is depending upon God to work in and through us, right? Well, Satan only has three avenues of temptation that he's used throughout all of time. And he uses them over and over and over again. He has habituated himself to evil to such a degree that he is extremely effective. You have no chance against him if you stand against him in the flesh. You will fall. So what must I do? Well, let me close with two very encouraging passages of Scripture. The first is in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And then James chapter 4 and verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What a great God we have. What a powerful God we have. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. And The subject is very uh, difficult to speak about because all of us have fallen prey to the evil one. And... Uh, if we get away from you, we will do so again. And it grieves us to no end. So Lord, we pray that you would protect us from evil and from the evil one. Help us to pray for one another. Help us to be in the word of God, washing our minds with truth each and every day. So that when temptations come, we won't fall, but we will stand approved by you. Lord, we would love to hear what happens in heaven when we do have the victory through Christ. We would love to think that you are saying to Satan, have you considered my servant so and so? But then, Lord, we know that what that invites. And we know we don't stand a chance without you. So, Lord, we look to you. Our eyes are steadfast upon you. We hang on to the hem of your garment awaiting the day when you will rescue us from the presence of sin and Satan forever. But until that day, Lord, help us to do battle royal against sin and Satan. And help us to do it not in the flesh, but in the power of your Holy Spirit, illumined by your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.